Okay. I know it's Easter, and that's a really big deal for you. And for everyone else here. And I just want you to know up front, I'm not here to debate or argue. Or ask you to prove anything to me. I'm just here to ask you one simple question. Is it really necessary for me to believe this? The resurrection of Jesus. I'm not looking for anything to replace what I already believe. I'm looking to maybe just add Jesus to my existing belief system. If this Easter stuff is true for you, then that's great. And I completely support it. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily true for me. For me. For me. So I want you to help me with something. I got a jar of marbles here. I'm going to pass it right down here. You get about five seconds each. I want it to get around the whole uh, group here. And guess how many uh, marbles are in there? Maybe write it down on your program, okay? I don't know why, but sometimes people fall asleep when I speak. So I got to give you something to keep you awake. As excited as I am about talking to you today about the resurrection, I'm even more pumped or as pumped to talk to you about what I'm talking about next week, what Jesus teaches about forgiveness. If you're here for the first time or first time in a long time, uh, we'd like to interest you in coming back. Yes, we do have an agenda for you. We want to help you grow in a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, do you know how many people are filled with bitterness? anger or resentment toward people that have double-crossed them, cheated them, hurt them, and they can't forgive them. I mean, we've all uh, messed up and need to be forgiven. A number of years ago, I was invited by a family to come to St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, the father was dying. He was right up against the finish line. And I got there, and his wife was there, the kids were there, the grandkids were there. And he said, I've done a lot of bad things. Can God forgive me? And I assured him, I said, Jesus died for every one of your sins. If you confess that to him and commit your life to Jesus, you're going to be good to go. And so we prayed right there with all the family, and he confessed his sins and committed his life to Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, when we were done, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Then he motioned me even closer. He said, and I've messed up with my family. Is there anything I can do to make it right? I said, I tell you, you gather them around and you get really specific person to person, whoever you think you failed, and you ask their forgiveness, I'm pretty sure you're going to be okay. Well, then I left, and uh, I turned uh, left on Barnes Road East. I stopped at a stoplight there. I was in a hurry. And uh, then and this is where Barnes Road uh, is two lanes, and it turns into one. And uh, a, a white Jeep pulled up right next to me. And uh, this guy had huge tires, you know, jacked him up about three feet off the ground. And I thought, you know, I'm in a hurry. There's no way I'm going to let this guy beat me off the line. <laughs> so when that line turned green, I punched it. But he punched it too. We're flying down Barnes Road neck and neck. And I'm thinking, what is with this guy? I got the inside lane. Who does he think he is? And then I realized he, he knew that if it got tight, he could just run right over me. So when we got to that point where somebody had to do something in our little game of chicken, I backed off. But I gave him a piece of my mind with my horn. I mean, come on, he'd cost me maybe three, maybe four seconds. Then when I settled down and my blood pressure subsided, I thought, you know how ridiculous I must look from heaven. You know, I'd just been talking to a family about God's love and compassion and then just in a matter of minutes, I turn into a driving maniac. I was like exhibit A for our depraved human nature. My point is we've all sinned and need God's forgiveness. And Christ's resurrection is the proof that Jesus' death on the cross for our sins achieved forgiveness. Now, if you're new to our church, like we saw in that video we just showed, only you can decide if it's necessary for you to believe in the resurrection. But I'd like to tell you why 
we believe it's true. Now, maybe you stopped going to church when you were in middle school. Your parents got a divorce and you just, the family stopped going. Maybe in high school you convinced your parents you didn't need to go anymore. Or maybe you dropped out when you hit college. Or maybe you've never gone to church. And for you, Easter is like maybe about eggs, maybe chocolate, maybe something about resurrection, but you're not sure you believe. Let me tell you why we believe the resurrection rings true. The resurrection was reported by eyewitnesses. The Apostle Paul, who wrote more than any other writer in the New Testament, writes, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, that's Jesus' brother, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I have persecuted the church of God. So Paul says, first he appeared to Peter, that's Cephas, and Peter's gospel was written by a friend of his named Mark. So we have the gospel of Mark. Then he appeared to the 12, the disciples. That will certainly include Matthew, who wrote another gospel, and John, who wrote another gospel. Then he says he appeared to over 500 people, believers at the same time. Luke says in his gospel, he wrote the fourth gospel, he said he interviewed all kinds of eyewitnesses. In our day, if you have a court case and you have two to three eyewitnesses, you have grounds for a good case. Paul says, we have over 500. If you don't believe me, go ask one of them. Then he appeared to James. Now, this is important. There's no record of James being a believer. James was Jesus' kid brother, his stepbrother. One time we read the family came to get Jesus out of the temple. They, they thought he was out of his mind. So presumably James was with them when they did that. Now, I asked you this last year. I'll ask you it again. What would it take for your brother, if you have siblings, for your brother to convince you that he is the son of God? You say, like, nothing, man. I mean, you would have to die and be raised again. And that's exactly what happened to James. Jesus appeared to him, he became a believer, and then James went on to be the leader of the New Testament church. And then finally, Paul tells us he appeared to Paul. Paul was adamantly opposed to Christians. He hated Christians. He hated them so much, he was putting them in jail. He says the other disciples were cowards, they ran away, but none of them did what I did. I was putting people in prison. I don't even, I can't even believe God would include me on this list. Now, the fascinating thing about this text, put it on there again, Pat, is that practically all scholars believe this was an early Christian creed read in churches around the world. And that it was written four to five years after Jesus died and rose. Now, this is really important. You say, what if early Christians made this whole resurrection thing up? Well, to be made up, a fable has to be at least three generations. You have to wait to write a fable until all the eyewitnesses have died. But this is written four to five years after Jesus rose. Paul says, if you don't believe me, go ask one of the other eyewitnesses. We believe the eyewitnesses' reports ring true. Another reason the resurrection rings true is because the way the writers wrote themselves into the narratives. Suppose you're making this stuff up. 80 years after the fact, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, but you want to pe people to think he did. How would you write yourself or the early believers into the resurrection narratives? I mean, Jesus said a number of times, I'm going to be crucified, and three days later, I will rise again. So you would think they would write themselves in as saying, okay, 
Jesus is going to rise again. And so the third day we went out to the tomb and we were all out there ready to meet Jesus. But we don't read that at all. Instead we read that women were the first ones to the tomb and they went out kind of timidly. They had spices. Spices are not for a risen person. They're for a dead person. And when the women got there and found the tomb empty, they were afraid. They ran back to tell the disciples that Jesus is gone, that the tomb is empty, and, and they said, this is nonsense. All the, all the early believers were surprised by Jesus' resurrection. We read that when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, she was shocked. When Jesus appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, we read they were stunned. When Jesus came to visit the 12 apostles, uh, disciples in the upper room, they couldn't believe it. It all reminds me of Lieutenant Frank Clements. From his earliest days, he wanted to fly airplanes. And so when he was old enough, he signed up for the U.S. Air Force. This was at the end of uh, World War II. And so within a short period of time, he was flying dangerous missions from England over the English Channel into France and Germany. He was from Big Spring, Texas, and uh, uh, everybody there uh, loved him, and, and, and Fourth, Priest, Fourth uh, Baptist Church there, they all prayed for Frank and, and uh, were anxious to get reports back on how he was doing, and one day, the father, Mr. Clements, got a report that uh, he was shot down in, over the English Channel. And so he ran and got his wife, and they ran to meet with Pastor Dunham, and uh, they wept together and prayed together. Then a few days later, they got the ominous uh, report, we regret to inform you that your son has been killed in action. Our deepest sympathies go with you. So all the people of Big Springs, Texas, mourned. They had a memorial service for him. Uh, West Texas people are close, so everybody came out and they laid a single red rose on his casket. Problem was, it was a case of misidentification. Frank Clements had not died. It was another Frank Clements. It was true that Frank Clements had been shot down over the English Channel, but uh, he survived. And he was picked up a couple days later, and uh, because he had been shot down, they said, you can take a leave of absence, go home and see your family. Well, Frank didn't know anything about this uh, other Frank Clements and the misidentification, so he didn't call. He didn't know his parents were mourning his death. And uh, so he took uh, the ship over the Atlantic, took a week. Then he took the train from the East Coast to Dallas. Then he, then he took a Greyhound from Dallas to Big Spring, Texas. When he got off the bus, he decided to walk home. S slung his uh, duffel bag over his shoulder and he didn't see anybody he knew. And when he got there, he heard his dad working in his shop outside the, beside the house and he just went up behind him, his dad had his back toward him and watched him for a few seconds and he said, Dad? And Mr. Clements froze. So he said it again, Dad? And his dad turned around and he rushed over to him, gave him a huge hug and he was in tears and squeezing him like crazy and, and, and Frank couldn't understand it because he was more like a handshake sort of dad. And uh, his dad, you know, backed up and then he ran into the house to get mom and his dad went down the street yelling, he's alive, he's alive. And the next day in the paper, Big Springs, Texas, big headlines, Lieutenant Frank Clements returns alive. Just like everybody in Big Springs was surprised that he'd returned alive, everybody was surprised that Jesus returned alive. And why would you have the stories begin with women coming to the empty tomb? In those days, women were not even allowed to testify in court. They were considered unreliable witnesses. The only reason women would play a leading role would be if that was the way it happened. And how about the, the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane when they're praying with Jesus and the guards came to arrest Jesus? What, don't you think you would write them in as standing shoulder to shoulder and saying, if you want Jesus, you've got to come to us. But we don't read that. Instead, we read they all were cowards and they ran. Peter had at least enough courage to follow along behind so he could kind of listen in on the trial and he was warming his hands by the fire in a middle school girl came up to him and says, I know you, you were a follower of Jesus. 
He says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know the man. Now, if you're Catholic, you understand this better than the rest of us, how important Peter is. He's the guy. And he's written into this narrative as a coward and a doubter and a total failure. And Mark, he tells us in his gospel, one of the Jewish guards grabbed him by the cloak. But he wasn't going to let himself be captured. No, no. So he squirreled out and he ran down the street naked. This stuff's in the Bible. You should read it. <laughs> if they fabricated these accounts, don't you think they would have written themselves in in a little better light? Instead, the narratives read like real history. The resurrection rings true. Still another reason the resurrection rings true is because the disciples changed inexplicably. In my experience, people do not change easily or quickly. Childhood characteristics go with us well into adulthood. So what explains the disciples changing from doubters and cowards into spiritual powerhouses? A few days after Jesus rose and ascended into heaven, the disciples went out into the streets and proclaimed Jesus Full, knowing full well that they could be arrested. They proclaimed, you killed Jesus, the Son of God. He rose from the dead. We've seen him, and the tomb is empty. If you don't believe us, go check it out for yourself. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. This is in Jerusalem. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent. Say you're sorry. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. A few days later we read, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then weeks later, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So 3,000 people were added uh, as believers in one day and then the church begin, uh, can continue to uh, increase rapidly day after day and even Jewish priests became believers. Now this all happened in Jerusalem where the Jewish and Roman leaders would do anything to stop this new movement. If they could have produced Jesus' body, they would have stopped this new belief in its tracks. But they couldn't produce a body because there wasn't one. The tomb was empty. So they started a rumor that the disciples had stolen the body. Matthew tells us, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Let me tell you, there is no way the disciples stole Jesus' body. Do you think they got together and said, hey guys, we know he died but just to keep the dream alive, let's go steal his body? Come on, if they all ran like middle schoolers after a Halloween prank when Jesus was alive, if they weren't willing to risk their lives when he was alive, why would they do it when he was dead? Come on, he said he was the Messiah. He said he was the Son of God. He said he was the resurrection and the life. All that turned out to be a lie once he died. So why risk their lives now? The last thing they were thinking was about stealing a body. And if they had stolen a body and buried it somewhere, don't you think one of them would have remembered where they buried that body when they were being threatened with death? One of them would have gone and dug up Jesus' body and said, here. But none of them did that. Instead, all of them proclaimed Christ boldly until the death. James, the brother of John, one of the disciples, be, was beheaded by Herod Agrippa in 44 AD. Peter was crucified in Rome. Peter objected to being crucified or put to death in the same way Jesus was. And they said, okay. So they crucified him upside down. Andrew was crucified in Patras, Greece. 
Thomas was speared in Madras, India. Bartholomew preached in Egypt, Arabia, and Iran before being skinned alive and beheaded in India. Simon the Zealot was sawed in half for preaching in Persia. Philip preached in Turkey. He was martyred with hooks put in his ankles and he was hung upside down. Matthew was murdered for preaching in Ethiopia. Why would they travel all over the world and preach Jesus and why were they willing to die for him? Because they saw the risen Christ. There's another crazy idea that's been floated. Jesus never died. Do you know where these ideas come from? If you ever took a religion class in college, you probably were told one of these things like the disciples stole Jesus' body or Jesus never died. You know where it comes from? They start with an a priori assumption that there's no supernatural in this world. Everything is natural, all there is. So there can't be miracles, so there can't be a resurrection, so they have to come up with an alternative history. A woman, named, uh, a woman wrote, J. Vernon McGee, our preacher said that on Easter Jesus just swooned on the cross and the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? McGee replied, dear sister, beat your preacher with a leather whip with 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours. Run a spear through his heart. Embalm him. Put him in an airless tomb for three days and see what happens. Oh, come on, I mean, if you believe Jesus was flogged with 39 lashes, carried a heavy cross up a hill, then he hung on the cross for hours, then he was speared in the side, then they wrapped him like a mummy, then they put him in a tomb and sealed it airtight. And then you believe that inside he somehow woke up and got up and found, his, found the door, even though it was pitch black in there, and he pushed away. This stone that's huge. And he looked around and he hopped in front of the guards without them seeing him. He went over to a tree and rubbed and rubbed until he got the, the mummy wrap off. And then he limped off. I mean, if you, it takes more faith to believe that than to believe in the resurrection. We believe the resurrection because the resurrection rings true. You say, so what? Is it necessary for me to believe in the resurrection? All right, let's see how, where, where are the, where's this jar of marbles? Make it back? All right, almost. Do you guys get it in the middle? All right, nice. Okay, so how many, too late. <laughs> you can make your guess right now if you want. All right. How many, uh, how many in here, Tyler? Huh? How many? 1,500? Oh, 500. Okay. Final answer? 159. 159. Okay. Yeah. Sam? 116. 116. Final answer? 316. 316. 127. 185. All right. There are 168 marbles in here. All right. Who got the closest to 168? What'd you get? You got 168? There we go, my ass. Wow. All right. Now, help me out, Maya. Your reward. Hand these out. Let me get a couple more. All right, Abby. All right, go. You do this section, you do this section. Only teenagers. All right. Okay, so I got some Starburst candies here. And... Uh, here we go. Sarah, Jamie. Okay, pop it in your mouth. Ladies. All right. Pop it in your mouth. Here we go. Teenager, how about you? Hmm. You're right. You got to take those two. All right, a couple more. You get one? Whoa, you can't have too many. All right, you guys. All right. Okay, put it in your mouth. Oh, we got one more. Where we go? You got one? Who else? Okay, I had shoulder surgery. Here we go. Whoa, that's a terrible throw. All right, that was, that was bad. That was bad, John. Okay. 
All right, so here are the flavors you're chewing on. You have strawberry, cherry, lemon, watermelon, orange, and fruit punch. What is the right flavor? Huh? Strawberry is the right flavor. For everybody? Wouldn't you say it's a preference? You know, depends on what you're, you like best, right? Okay. So, the marbles, as a matter of fact, right? There are 168 marbles in here. That's a fact, correct? Candy preference is, you know, your personal opinion, right? Okay, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is it more like the marbles, a matter of fact? Or is it more like personal opinion? No, 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 only teenagers can answer me. <laughs> Colby, Beckley, Tyler, what do you think? Oh, it suddenly got quiet in here. Huh? It's more like the marbles, okay? Anybody think it's more like a preference? You believe it's true, you don't? All right, if you were there... When Jesus died, I guarantee you, you would have seen blood dripping down the cross. You would have seen them, him take his lifeless body after they had speared it down and wrapped him in mummy, mummy wrap. And then you would have seen them place him in a tomb. And then three days later, either the tomb was empty or it was not. Either it's a historical fact or it didn't happen. It can't be true for you, but not true for you. And if the resurrection is true, then it's the most important event in the history of the, of the world. It means that God has seen all of us, that we've all messed up, we've all sinned against him and each other, and we need to be forgiven. So he sent his son to die on the cross for all our sins, and if we believe in him and put our trust in him, we can be forgiven. It also means that God has won the victory over death. If we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we can have life now and have life forever. It also means that God has taken charge of the world. He has defeated evil. He will fully reclaim this world from all its evil when Jesus Christ comes again. Now, in a minute, I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell God that you believe in the resurrection. But he will not force you to believe in him or spend eternity with him. God loves you too much to take away your freedom. So you must choose whether you believe the resurrection is true. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much that we can believe that the resurrection is true. There's so many eyewitness accounts. Uh, the way they wrote themselves in, it just reads like history, like truth. And that the early followers were so changed. I want to give you an opportunity now just to say something to God. Everybody close their eyes and uh, tell Him what you think. Maybe your response today is, well, I'm not convinced, but I'm interested in learning more. Well, then tell Him that. Or maybe today you say, I'm in. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. He died and rose again and the resurrection is true. Or maybe you say, I'm in already. I came here today already believing. But whatever your situation, I'd like to invite you to pray with me. And if the words I pray to God would speak for you, would you just silently pray with me? Uh, dear Father, thank you for getting me here today. I do admit that I've messed up in my life. I've done some things that I'm not proud of. And I need your forgiveness. Would you forgive me? I do believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose from the dead. And I want to commit my life to him right now. So Lord Jesus, come into my life. And Jesus, I want to follow you the rest of my life to the best of my ability. Whatever that takes. I will start reading the Bible so I can learn more about you. I will pray more. I'll even come back to church, Lord. I hear about this forgiveness series. I'll do what it takes because I want to be a true follower. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.